Hello everyone, this is Wiley. I'm here. In today's video, we're going to be going through the menu system of the Canon R6. There's definitely a lot to go through, so I'm going to try to get through it very quickly. To get to the menu system, all you have to do is hit the menu button right here. It's going to present you with this menu. So we're going to go from left to right, and we're going to go through every sub-menu in all of these major sections. So we're going to go ahead and start with the camera icon. And the first thing that you're going to be presented with is image quality. So if you go in here, this is where you can turn on your RAW. So if you want to actually flip on your RAW, it tells you that you're going to have to use this dial up top. By default, it does not save a raw image, but I definitely recommend it if you want to do any type of editing in something like Lightroom. The basic difference between raw and compressed raw is that a raw image is going to take more memory on your SD card, whereas a compressed one, they're going to go ahead and reduce the file size. What that means is that when you export it to your computer, a compressed raw is going to take a little bit more CPU time to uncompress it so that your computer can actually read it. But most people nowadays have so fast computers, it's almost always worth going with a compressed raw because you can save more images on your sd card down here in your jpegs you can select the resolution size i always recommend going with the largest because you can always downsize but it's very difficult to upsize so if you just want to save these settings you can just hit the set button the next one to go through is your crop ratio so it's by default set to full so it's using the full sensor I always like using the 16 by 9 because most of my images end up on the internet because 16 by 9 is just one of the common ratios that you see on computer monitors. So that is the one that I most commonly use. But if you want the largest image, then I suggest you go with full, but I'm going to stick with 16 by 9. Moving on to subsection 2. The first one is your exposure compensation. Now it's usually bound to a dial when you're taking pictures, so I don't really do anything with this particular one. But if you don't have exposure compensation bound to one of these buttons or dials, then you're going to have to come in here and change it through here. ISO speed settings, it's already set to auto for program mode. And if you're just beginning with this, I recommend not really changing anything on the screen. But if you do want to change to a specific ISO, then you can come in here and do it. But honestly, if you're going to be changing ISOs, you definitely want to bind it to one of the dials because it's just going to be easier to handle as you take pictures or video. The next one down is HDR PQ settings. So this allows you to turn on high dynamic range for your pictures. It's definitely an up and coming technology. What I want to tell you here is that when you actually turn on HDR, it's going to tell you to actually look at tone priority settings, which we'll look at a little bit later. But when you do turn this on, you stop generating JPEGs and you start generating a new type of file called a HEAF file, which is a high dynamic range file. The thing to look out for here is that on most Macs, a HEAF file, it'll recognize it and you can go ahead and display the image. But when you transfer it over to a Windows PC, it might not recognize it right out of the box so you might actually have some work to do in order to get it to actually understand what this new file is so just something for you to understand if you want to turn on this image it's definitely the future just understand that there might be some compatibility issues if you do decide to use this file type Now, when we go out to the middle of the screen, because we have HDR PQ turned on, you'll notice that auto light optimizer has been turned off. If you do want to actually use the auto light optimizer, then what you need to do is you need to go ahead, turn it off and you will have this available to you. And what my suggestion for you here is that if you do like the Canon look, the Canon colors, then I would just go ahead and just keep it on. But if you want to do your own editing, if you really want to do things in RAW, then you might want to consider turning it off. Also, one thing to consider when you actually have this on is that it's actively changing the contrast and the brightness. So if you're doing video, I probably would just turn it off unless you're just doing some casual vlogging, in which case you're not really worried about a standard brightness or a standard contrast. The next one down, tone highlight priorities. You can actually hit the info button. You can actually read about this. It's definitely worth reading and experimenting on. But one thing that I do want to talk about really quickly, and we've already seen this, is that if you do want to take high dynamic range images, it already suggests to you to go ahead and enable highlight tone priorities. So there are definitely a lot of choices for you to experiment with here. If you're just a beginner, I recommend going ahead, turning this off and just sticking with JPEGs for now, and then just keep this off getting used to the camera and then you can switch over to high dynamic range photography and see if you like it 
anti-flickering shooting. So this is when you actually take images and you'll notice bars of light going through your pictures. If you're seeing that in your pictures, it generally has to do with fluorescent lighting or just bad lighting inside of a building. If you do see that, you can enable it, but there is a consequence to enabling it, which is the reason why it's not enabled by default in the first place. So definitely read through that. If you are seeing flickering, then you do want to enable it. But when you're actually not seeing any of that, you do just want to keep it disabled because you don't want to live with the disadvantages. External speed light or a flash attached to your camera, not something we're going to go over, but if you do have an external flash and you know how to use it, then you can come in here and change the settings. Moving on to the next screen, the first one we see is white balance. Auto white balance is usually where I keep it because the camera does a very good job, but you can go ahead and scroll through all the presets and you can also do Kelvins. The only thing wrong with using Kelvins is that it only goes in increments of 100, whereas if you use auto white balance, it can actually go in single digit increments. So it's a little bit more accurate. You can also come down in here and you can actually have a white priority so if you're taking pictures and you're noticing that it's a little bit warm so a little bit gold a little bit yellow a little bit orange and you want something that's a little bit cooler you can come in here and set it to a white priority and that's definitely going to give it a much more cooler look so it's something to play with if you think your images are a little bit warm i do find this useful at times when i'm inside and i'm using some studio lightings that are a little bit warm but again, you're going to have to come in here and really try it a couple of times to get used to it. But in general, auto white balance does a very good job. And I would just suggest sticking with that. Custom white balance, it's something that I'm not going to go over, but it's something that you can do. You can actually go ahead and set your own white balance. This is something that professionals will do ahead of time when they're about to do a professional shoot. But in general, I don't really use that because I can change it in post. White balance shift, this is something that I do very often, which is I like to go ahead and shift the entire color science a little bit, but I don't want to change it too much. It's usually very safe to shift it blue or red, but it's really not that safe to shift it green or purple. But this is kind of just to give a little bit of styling to your colors when you're actually taking pictures or video. I do recommend coming in here and kind of playing with it. This is just to make your image look a little bit unique. But again, it's about style. If you just want to take just good pictures, then just keep it in the center and not really fool with this thing. Color space, I've always kept it at the defaults, but if you do want to play around with Adobe RGB, you're more than welcome to. Definitely recommend you read up on that. Picture style, this is basically the picture profile, and if you select any one of these, so standard, you can go ahead and select the more info, and in here you can fine tune your sharpness, contrast, saturation, and also color tone. So what I would recommend here is that you leave these at defaults, and down here at the bottom, there are three that you can define yourself. You can go ahead, go into the info, and you can select a default picture profile that you wanna set off of. So say I wanna be a portrait one, but I want the contrast to be a little bit more toned down, so I can go ahead and tone that down. And this will become my own custom picture profile, and it's something that I can use without actually changing the defaults. When you first start off, I definitely recommend just going off with one of the default standards. Once you actually start learning the camera and how pictures are being rendered then you can go in here and start tweaking some of the settings to your own liking the next one down is clarity and how i would describe this is that if you go negative it softens the image up and if you go positive it kind of gives it a little bit more gritty look if you use adobe lightroom it's the same thing that clarity does in there i generally just leave it at default and if i want to change some things around i'll go ahead and do it in post so this is not one of the settings that i would change very often lens aberration correction so this is to correct for any distortions in the lens I don't see any reason on why you would ever want to turn this off, especially if you're using Canon lenses. So I always have this on and I don't change anything about that one. On the next menu, we have long exposure noise reduction. This I leave off. We have high ISO speed and R. This is something that I don't really change very often. You do have the info button. You can go ahead and read through it to see if you actually want to change it. I'm just going to go ahead, leave it at standard. Dust delete data. This is something that I've never used before, but the premise behind this is that if you actually get dust on your sensors and you notice it and you've already taken a lot of pictures, this will actually remove the dust from your images. Again, not something that I've used before, but if you do have dust 
lost on your sensors and it's very noticeable, you might want to try that or you just might want to correct it in post. So it's definitely something that you might want to read up on, but I've never used it. So I don't really have any recommendations or suggestions on it. So a lot of things in here is about stacking your photography, which isn't something that I'm going to get into. You'll notice this one's grayed out. And if I go ahead and select it, it says my attached lens. This doesn't actually support it. So it's probably only specific, probably more pro glass that actually supports this feature. The next one down HDR modes. This is not something that I'm going to cover, but you can definitely come in here and fine tune your HDR. But like what I just said, that's really something for its own video to cover HDR. So I'm not going to change anything in here. Focus bracketing. I'm going to keep it disabled because we're really not going to be talking about stacking photos. But if you do like those type of things and you do know what you're doing, then you can definitely come into this menu system and really work through that. Interval timer. So this is when you actually want to do time lapses and you can come in here and you can adjust all of your settings. So how often you want to take a picture and how many pictures you want to take. But we're not going to be working with uh, time lapses for this video. Just know that if you do want to do your time lapses, you can do it in here. Bulb timer. So this is something that you can do with one of the custom settings. Again, I'm not going to be talking about in this videos, but if you do want to do really long exposures, there's the menu option for you to actually look at it. Shutter modes. This is definitely an interesting one. I definitely recommend you read up on first curtain shutters. I think there's a lot of good benefits from it. So I would definitely suggest just sticking with the defaults, but you can go to a pure mechanical. But if you need a silent shutter, you can go with the electronic shutter, which means your mechanical shutter will not actually actuate. So it makes for a very quiet camera but I do like the first curtain shutter. So I just leave it at the defaults release shutter without card. I generally actually like to have this off because if I don't have my SD card in my cameras, let's just say I take it out and then I go ahead and turn on the camera. If I push down on the shutter, it actually doesn't actuate. It actually is just another reminder that there is no card in the camera. Even though it says it on the screen, I still sometimes just totally ignore it and I forget to put an SD card into the camera. So I do like to have that off. I'm gonna go ahead and put it back in. Going on to the next one, image stabilization. This is actually digital image stabilization and it does work for photography. So you're going to get another crop on your sensor. I personally like to turn that off, especially for the R6, since it has in-body stabilization. The mechanical stabilization on this camera is terrific. So I have no reason to turn on digital image stabilization for photography. You might want to do it for video, but we'll address that in another video touch shutter. So this is an interesting one. If you want it so that you can actually just push to take a picture, you can definitely do that if you want to. If you're a smartphone user, you actually might find this to be a very useful feature if you want to turn it on. I generally have it off because I like to use my shutter button up top. Whoops, definitely hit that. Image review by default, you have two seconds to look at a picture every single time you take a picture. I generally like to keep this off because I like to review my pictures in bulk. But if you do like to actually review every one of your images as soon as you take it, then you can actually just go ahead and select one of these. The hold one might be interesting for you, but generally speaking, I like to have that off. Do you want to review your images in your viewfinder when you actually have your eye up to it? Like I said, I generally don't like to do it, so I keep that disabled, but that's personal preference right there. High speed display. So this is off by default. That's because I have the camera in single shot. So when I actually push down the shutter, I only take one image. So I'm going to have to go ahead and change it to multiple shots. So when I push down the trigger, it's going to take multiple pictures. So in this particular setting, what I can do is I can turn this on so that the refresh rate on the screen is actually faster to keep up with all of the images I'm taking. And I'm sure it's going to also take more battery life. But if you are taking continuous multiple shots, then it might be worthwhile for you to go ahead and turn that on. Meter timer, which is set at eight seconds. That's this button right here. So this allows you to lock your exposure. So when I select this button, it locks my exposure and it locks it for eight seconds. If I want it longer, if I want it shorter, I can go ahead, go into the menu system and I can change it. So it just went off lock right now. So if you come in here, you can actually change it to be a lot longer or you can change it to be a lot shorter, but it is on a timer and it's set default to eight seconds. I generally don't use this feature. In fact, I rebind this button to be a switch. So it's going to be either on or off. So I can show you that later, but if you do like it on a timer, then you can come in here and change it. it 
exposure simulation, I definitely recommend keeping this on. So basically when your image is too dark or too bright, it actually simulates that so you know what's going on because it's showing you a simulation of what the exposure is going to be. Just go ahead, keep it on. It's definitely very useful shoot display info there's a lot of information in here so if you go ahead go into the screen info this shows you all of the different info screens that you can have generally speaking i like to keep it simple so i'd like to turn this one off i'll keep this one i'll remove this one and i'll remove this one and i'll select ok so when i do this now if i actually go through the info menu it just gives me a toggle so i either have some things or i have everything and that's kind of what i like because i don't really want to switch through too many menu systems but again it's personal preference right there if you do like to go through a lot of different displays then you can turn these back on or turn these off i would recommend only having a few screens on because it is very useful to not have to toggle through a whole bunch of screens the vertical screen, so if you had this camera vertically, here are all the screens that you have. And again, you can turn this on and off based on your own preference. Vertical display, kind of self-explanatory. Do you want the screen to change when it's vertical? I personally like to have it on, so I just leave it at defaults. Grid display, so I definitely recommend at least having the 3x3 on because it's just a traditional photography grid that you can have on, which is very useful, but again, personal preference right here. Histogram display, which is very useful for photographers. You can change it between brightness or RGB. I usually keep it at brightness, but I definitely change it to the smaller one because the smaller one just takes up significantly less space and it gives you the ability to actually look at your picture a whole lot more. But again, personal preference right there, but I do like the smaller display one. Focus distance display. So there's definitely a lot of different ways that you can look at distances that you're focusing on. I generally don't look at this in my my display so I just turn it off because I've never really use it but if you do use it there are definitely a lot of different options and you can choose between feet and meters but for myself I've never really found this to be useful I just turn it off because it's just one less thing on the screen but again personal preference right there Vertical display format, so you can choose between two. One of them's a little bit smaller, the other one's a little bit bigger, but there's not really that much to talk about. Display performance, so you have two options here, power savings and smooth. Smooth most likely will give you a faster refresh rate, which will consume more power. I'm usually okay with just going by defaults there. Number nine in the subsection is all about video recording, so I'm just gonna go through very briefly because video settings is gonna be its own video. But the first one, you can go ahead and select the different types of video. I usually like to record in 4K30, but again, different preferences. When it comes to sound, I definitely like to set it to manual, and I definitely like to set the recording levels to whatever mic that I'm using. Right now, you notice that it's entirely way too loud, and I can go ahead and adjust that. But in order to talk about this, we definitely do want to use an external mic to get the best audio quality available. Again, we'll go through this a little bit later. When it comes to max ISO, I go ahead and leave it at the default settings for now. We can go ahead and adjust it later. Auto slow shutter. Personally, I like to turn this off because I don't want the camera to automatically change settings on me. But if you're just doing some casual videos and vlogging, you can go ahead and turn it on. But if you're actually recording any type of professional video, you definitely don't want your shutter speeds changing. So I would go ahead and I would just turn that off. But again, if you're just doing any type of vlog or casual video, then you can go ahead and just leave that on and it'll be fine. Shutter button function for movies. This is a very interesting one. So the shutter button up front right here, you can actually get it to do many different things. My favorite one is to actually to have one shot autofocus. So when I'm recording a movie, if I half press on the shutter button, I can instantly start the focus. And once it attains focus, it'll automatically shut off. This is a quick way of adjusting autofocus that's within your control. But again, we'll get into this when we actually start talking about video recordings on this camera. But definitely come in here and check out these two and figure out which one you like. My preferred one is the one shot autofocus. All right, moving on to the next one, autofocus operations. So you can have it as one shot. So when you actually push the shutter button, it'll only focus once and then it'll turn itself off. Or you can have servo, which is basically a continuous autofocus. But most people are very comfortable with using one shot autofocus because it just makes a lot of natural sense. So I'll just select that as default autofocus methods. So we've already talked about it with this button, but here are all of the different types of autofocus that you can actually use. So you can go into the menu and actually change that, but it's much easier to just use this shortcut button right over here. 
subject detection. So you can have priority on people, animal, or no priority. So if you're taking pictures of people, obviously have people on. If you want to take pictures of animals, which I haven't really tried this out, but it seems to work very well from what a lot of reviewers says, then definitely turn that on or no priority. I'll just go ahead and keep it on defaults because it is very useful for me. Now you'll notice this is turned off right now and that's because right now I have single point autofocus turned on. If I go ahead and move it to tracking, you'll see this light back up because it's going to be using continuous autofocus to keep track of the subject, which is a person and also detecting the eye. So it does change depending on what type of focus methods that you're using right now. Continuous autofocus that's disabled right now, but this is definitely very useful if you want to actually track a subject in say single autofocus. You can go ahead and turn that on and whatever is in that box, it'll automatically continuously try to keep that in focus. This is definitely useful for things like sports, but if you're taking pictures of still images, then you can just disable it because it is a little bit easier to know what's going on. The next one down is movie servo. So definitely have that enabled if you have face detect and eye detect on because you want that continuous autofocus going on. If you disable it, then it'll get focused once and then it's just gonna shut off. So it's not something that you would want if you're using autofocus for your video. Touch to drag. So this is something that's very interesting. Basically, you can actually make a portion of the screen. If you touch it, it'll actually move your autofocus box. So how you would use this if you had it enabled is that once you're out on the main screen, if you have your eye up to the viewfinder, you can now move your autofocus with your screen right here. I'm going to go ahead and disable it because I don't really use that very often. Moving on to the next screen, you can have different autofocus modes. So you can have autofocus, obviously, or you can have manual focus. But for the most part, I do have autofocus on. Manual focus peaking. This is something that I really do like to turn on when I'm in manual focus. This is where you'll get the red fringes around a subject when you're actually in manual focus. I'll go ahead and I show that to you right now. So if I go back out, I go to manual focus and I go out, you'll notice that there's a red fringe, or at least I hope you can see it, because it's telling me that this is actually in focus. You can go ahead and use the zoom in to try to make sure that you actually have everything in focus, so it is very useful. But manual focus is definitely a video for another day. I generally have autofocus on. Autofocus guides, and let me go back to manual focus really quick. This is actually a very cool feature, and I love it for the Canon system. But when you turn it on, what you'll notice is that you'll get your standard autofocus box. So if I were to move this around and I were to change focus on the lens, what you'll notice is that you get this icon and the closer that I am to actually getting the subject in focus, it'll go ahead and line up. And when it's actually green, I know that I have perfect focus on whatever's in that box. So it's a really great assist tool if you're not confident on whether or not you actually have perfect focus on a subject. Definitely go in there, try it out because you might actually find out you like manual focus once you actually start using this because it is such a powerful feature. Definitely go in there, try it out. It is really cool. Autofocus beam firing. So this is the light that will flash out to try to gain focus when it's really dark. I generally have it off because it can be very annoying to your subject. In general though, I have it disabled and I re-enable it if I come across a situation where I know I'm not getting autofocus in low light situations and enabling it will allow me to actually gain focus so I can get sharp images. So those are my suggestions on that. Moving on to the next one. This is probably one of the more important screens that you really need to actually go in there and play with. So on this screen, this actually allows you to change the behavior of your autofocus. So definitely spend a little time in here actually learning this one because it's definitely one of the most important screens that you're gonna have. If your subject's not in focus, then what good is it? So the first one, which is the default, actually works very well. You can probably keep it there forever and it'll work well for you, but just keep in mind there are other settings that you can use that might help you just a little bit. So right here, the second option, it's actually going to track your subject much more closely. It's not gonna get distracted. That might be useful for you. In the third option, it's going to allow the autofocus to work at maximum speed. The fourth option is basically more for sports. So if you're actually doing a lot of sports photography or things that are moving very fast, you might wanna try option four. Like I said, 
The first option does really well, it's all purpose, but you know what, if you're doing a specific type of photography or videography, then switching to one of these options might just give you a little bit extra autofocus improvements and that could be really huge for you. So definitely think about that. Moving on, lens electronic manual focus. This one actually might be interesting for you to turn on, but basically when you actually attain autofocus, it disables the manual control ring on your lens so that you don't accidentally push yourself out of autofocus. But there are instances where you might wanna fine tune that autofocus. So you use the autofocus to get close and then you can fine tune tune that manually to get to that perfect sharpness. It might work for when you're using very shallow depth of field or say you have a lens that just might be off a little bit and you want to actually fine tune it. It does happen, but for the most part, most Canon lenses are going to get perfectly sharp pictures and you don't really need that. But if you find that your photography for a specific lens just need a little bit manual fine tunement, then you can go ahead and turn that on one shot af release priority so this is an interesting one and i go back and forth on it all the time but basically you can take a picture before the autofocus mechanism is done in other words the subject isn't actually all the way in focus yet but you can go ahead and take that picture a lot of people like it that way this is something that you're going to have to play with i generally leave it at the default but it does feel like it's taking control away from you and people just don't like that type of feeling so it's definitely one of those mixed bags i would definitely recommend you trying both sides if figuring out what you like. Switch tracking subject. So this is when your camera is focused in on one thing and then you ask it to focus in on something else. How fast do you want that transition? Slow is generally a good default because it's a very smooth transition. It actually looks really good in video, but for photography, you might just want it to be super snappy. So you might want to speed it up. Generally speaking, I leave it at the default because it really works really well. Lens drive autofocus impossible. So this is when your camera can't focus in on something and it continuously hunts, which by default I do like, so I don't change that setting. Limit AF method. So this is all the different types of autofocus modes and you can go ahead and disable them if you have an autofocus mode that you don't want and you don't want to accidentally just select it. Generally speaking, I don't have much of a problem having all of them enabled. It's very easy to see which one you're on and you can very easily correct it because you have a shortcut button right here. So I don't really do anything for that screen. AF method selection control. So this is the button up here and it's bound to this button by default. I don't really change it. You can actually bond it to this dial up top, but I wouldn't recommend it. Orientation link AF. So if you come in here and when you actually flip your camera, you can actually have your autofocus points in two different spots. Generally speaking, I like it to be combined because it just gives a little bit more continuity because the box won't just jump to a different section. So this first one, initial servo AF point, it's set to auto. You can come in here and read the infographic on this. And honestly, I have tried all of the selections and it doesn't really feel like it makes much of a difference. If somebody actually has something to say about that, definitely leave it in the comments below, but I just keep it at auto. Seems to work great for me and I don't really intend to change that. Focus ring rotation. So if you want to invert what your autofocus ring does, you can come in here and do that. I generally don't touch that. RF lens manual focus sensitivity. So you can go in here and change the sensitivity. I just leave it at default. And then the last one, sensitivity AF point selector. I leave that at zero because honestly, I've never really had any issues using the manual focus rings on the lenses that I have. So I haven't felt a need to actually go in there and fidget with it. But if you feel like your manual focus ring needs a little bit tweaking, then this is definitely the menu screen that you want to come in here and start tweaking some things. So I just got done editing the first two menu screens and it's already a 30 minute video. So I'm just gonna go ahead, cut it off right here and I'll pick back up in part two and hopefully I can fit the remaining screens in part two, but we'll see how it goes. I hope this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, definitely leave in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.